Before I get started, a massive thanks to Dell and to Jordan and to NYU for all of their efforts to make this conference possible and also to all of my colleagues who are panelists for their thoughts and feedback um, on the workshop version of this paper. It has evolved fairly dramatically since then. I want to start today with a bunch of rhetorical questions, which is not normally my, my modus operandi, but because I think this whole paper project has been the result of attempting to figure out what questions I want to be asking and where they might lead. So I'll start off by asking, to what extent are the marginalized conscious of their marginalization? What impact can cultural distaste have on the culturally distasteful? And I've been thinking about this specifically because I'm back on my own campus. And here, Every day when I arrive at work, I immediately assign, see a sign about microaggressions, comparing the problem, metaphorically, to death by a thousand mosquito bites, each little more than an annoyance, but ones that can collectively drain minority populations dry. And I think of this in relation to Roman merchants who were a favored punching bag for Roman elites. The topos of the greedy, deceitful merchant is commonplace in ancient literature, and historians have been challenged to determine the relationship between reality and rhetoric. While everyone agrees that elite sources are not trustworthy reflections of day-to-day -day life, there is conflicting evidence of artisans and traders who were socially and legally ostracized, but also others who rose to positions of prominence. Each documented microhistory seems to paint a slightly different picture making it difficult to assess how the group was viewed in Roman culture as a whole, and how, building upon that, the group responded to those perceptions. Were they cowed and meek in the face of disdain, or did they rub their financial success in the faces of stuffy aristocrats? In this paper, I want to examine not only the well-trod ground of elite disdain for trade, but also its culinary, excuse me, elite praise for agriculture before arguing that negative stereotypes against Roman merchants were socially and economically consequential for members of a number of professions. I'll do so by starting with the elite sources that are traditionally used to define the nature of these biases and explore some recent scholarly arguments before investigating the more complex stereotypes and opinions about trade that made regular appearances in non-elite sources. I'll argue that while these are related to elite objections about commerce, they are generally more nuanced, not only allowing for some merchants to be exceptions to the rule, but also skewering merchants with ever more specific and biting stereotypes. In pursuit of these perspectives, I'll look at both popular sources and examples of merchant self-representation, where it's possible to see the anxieties that plague this group and the real harms that were done to merchant prospects. Recently, the social world, worlds of merchants have been the focus of renewed scholarly attention. As I've argued elsewhere, economic history of the ancient world has progressed to a stage where understanding the impact of social norms is essential. And in attempting to analyze these norms, we are faced with the staggering complexity of Roman social judgments. While it would be impossible even to summarize the field's findings today, I want to look closely at one recent addition to discussion, which wrestles with many of the same issues that motivate my own work. In the recent Skilled Labor and Professionalism in Ancient Greece and Rome, Emmanuel Mayer asserted that elite disdain for trade in the Roman world cannot be considered as the dominant cultural definition of merchanthood. And then in fact, Romans held the pursuit of gain in high, or at least higher regard than has been previously believed. He's argued that our evidence shows at the micro-historical level of the individual trader within a small community that anti-commercial bias did not affect economic activity, that commerce did not grind to a halt in the face of supposedly widespread distrust of those in retail and artisanal professions. His case is built upon the evidence of the plutocratic nature of Roman society, and the presence of political figures with either strong roots or continued participation in trade. Indeed, John Darm's essential commerce and social standing in ancient Rome makes a similar point, laying the wide gulf bare to our uh, assessment between the rhetoric of anti-commercialism that was spotted by elites and the reality of their own economic actions. 
In light of the cognitive dissonance required to both despise trade and actively pursue it for one's own interests, Mayer is right to critique the impulse to center elite voices in the discussion of how merchants and artisans were viewed in Roman society. Mayer further argues that the line between economic conduct that was deemed sordid and that which was respectable was artificial and tenuous in that it was wholly invented by elite authors. He continues that these moral and moralized categories and biases did nothing to limit the actual behavior of Romans. And moreover, that most merchants must have been blissfully unaware of the stereotypes that pervaded ancient literature. This is a complicated hypothesis and it's one that requires a variety of evidence to test. While it's true that the average Roman cobbler or carpenter never read the accusations leveled against him in Cicero or Seneca, Mayer's work is focused on the contradiction that underlies elite disdain and does not engage with the casual workaday bias that also pervaded non-elite culture. Professionals, skilled and otherwise, merrily attacked their social and economic peers, both across and within specific trades. Our evidence is scattered, but it's not inconsistent. Non-elites also harbored ill will toward merchants and their behavior reflected their bias. This was not identical to elite objections to the illiberal arts, but nevertheless, it posed social and economic challenges to tradesmen. To understand the differences and distinctions between elite and non-elite stereotypes, the cultural frameworks into which merchants were most commonly placed, it will be best to begin with the Romans preferred binary pair, the farmer and the merchant. Philostratus's Heroicus offers a useful example as the dialogue begins with characters, caricatures really, of each type. At the offset, a Venetian representative of two common stereotypes, one ethnic and one professional, waits for a favorable wind and sits in conversation with a vine dresser, an agriculturalist of some skill, and in the world of the dialogue, a man with peculiarly detailed knowledge about Homeric heroism. The latter approaches the former, offering a strange backhanded compliment to his new acquaintance that neatly summarizes the most common stereotype leveled against traders. Yet just as you are praised for your sailing skill, in the same way you are stereotypes, dia blepleste, as money lovers and greedy rascals because of your business dealings. When the Phoenician questions how exactly vine dresser profits from his work, the agriculturalist replies that he does not associate with merchants and does not know what a drachma is. He says, I trade a bull for grain and a goat for wine and other such exchanges, and I only allow a little haggling. This implicit association of money and moral corruption is common in ancient literature, dating at least back to Herodotus, and it's generally recounted in this way, with virtuous men, usually some stamp of farmer, eschewing the vice of greed by distancing themselves both from commerce and commercial agents. Importantly, money alone did not define the archetypes. Their central conceit is that farmers and merchants occupied extreme positions along the moral spectra of honesty and deception, hard work and predation, self-sufficiency and dependence. In the world of fiction, these values, virtues and vices, provide the reader with a shorthand for identifying protagonists and antagonists. In this case, the cultural implications of farming and commerce immediately communicate that the vine dressers' positions should be imbued with authority and given primacy over those of the Phoenician. More generally, these tropes reinforce commonly held beliefs about the moral standing of economic actors and establish farmers in a position of social and moral superiority. While potentially confusing from our own perspective and the modern, especially American emphasis on entrepreneurship as being a praiseworthy quality, the moral categorization that the Romans assigned to these professions may be understood within their cultural context. Romans readily understood the physical toil and benefits of working the land. They associated land ownership, especially with personal and national pride as only a system that had once depended upon farmers for its military could. But there was significantly less understanding of the value and hard work that could be associated with commerce and production. Andrea Giardina has argued that trade, and especially small-scale retail, was not even considered to be labor in Roman society. 
as it was not itself generative, but rather at best adaptive or distributive. As a result, it was viewed at best as a service, but more often as a shortcut, one that catered to the laziness and baser impulses of men who should have at least attempted to do everything themselves. This moral judgment attached to trade was accordingly not pointless blustering. While Romans felt that trade added little or nothing of value to the goods that it sold, their true fear was that it posed a threat to the moral foundations of their society. Those who relied upon trade became less self-sufficient and more inclined to indulge their desire for other kinds of luxury. Artisans and professionals like doctors and teachers occupied a slightly different position as this could be considered at a minimum to be semi-skilled labor. But many were viewed as sordid due to their proximity to dirt of various kinds and all carried the stigma of being fields that were somewhat akin to slavery. Whether blacksmith or banker, these professionals were obliged to pursue a wage and were therefore less free than the idealized version of agriculturalists who worked for themselves to eat and support their families, not to sell a surplus. Seneca goes so far as to state in a famous letter to a friend regarding the liberalist portion of liberal studies that no training or study that results in money making could possibly be considered good or befitting an elite man. He argues that the fault in such study arises in that it inspires greed and exposes the learner to close, close contact with the ignoble people who taught the necessary skills. Seneca is somewhat unusual in his condemnation of instructors but he takes a very broad view of who belongs in that category, seemingly lumping together master craftsmen with other kinds of professional actors. All in his mind directed learners away from the pursuit of wisdom and toward profit, as even the most skilled doctor still received payment for his work and was ordered about by his employers. Wage labor not only made artisans and professionals dependent upon the financial support and whims of others, but it also encouraged greed, as no amount of money could be readily identified as enough. Avarice was the great sin of all merchants, and many of their stereotypical faults were associated with this original crime. Of these, deceit was the most common, as it was believed that a desire for gain would naturally encourage merchants to become dishonest about issues of both quantity and quality. Farmers, by contrast, did not have to sully themselves with money. And therefore, they remained independent, self-sufficient, and above all, morally beyond reproach. They were the straight talkers and the honest laborers of the Roman world, associated with all the best qualities that were connected to Romanitas itself. Of course, the farmer-merchant binary is known to be historical fiction. Individuals up and down the social ladder intentionally engaged in varied economic strategies. These often included a mixture of agricultural, artisanal, and retail labor, the better to mitigate the risks inherent in operating in variable markets and microclimates. Urban and rural spheres were always interdependent, and further, both farmers and merchants were equally capable of being greedy and dishonest. But it's important to note that even if we see the failings behind this category, we nevertheless are living within the Roman framework. We have evidence of disputes and deceptions among farmers and among merchants, and no one holds a monopoly on moral behavior. Yet the Romans nevertheless did lean upon categories of trade averse elite, greedy merchant, or honest farmer types. All of these were socially pervasive. And even in the absence of a large literate body of tradesmen who were reading the libel of elite philosophers, there's plenty of evidence for the manifestations of this bias in their lives. As with other kinds of prejudice, anti-commercialism was deeply impactful on the structure and day-to-day -day conduct of trade. And merchants were isolated in Roman society by both legal forms of stigma. The former has been previously studied thoroughly by other legal and economic historians, especially those who have focused on the effects of infamia and the restrictions placed on senatorial trading. The category of law limited the social and economic prospects of members of certain professions. And while they did not prevent individuals entering and practicing those trades, they nevertheless singled them out as undesirable social contacts. In fact, the legal sources themselves are often explicitly complementing 
the bias that is found in moral and social norms as a justification for their own existence. Ulpian offers a strong example as he instructs Romans to steel themselves against compassion for merchants. Harsh laws, he argues, are necessary to restrain them because they are naturally inclined to ally themselves with criminals in their pursuit of profit. The law existed to counter the moral degeneracy of these people, which was accepted to such a degree that laws could be passed to specifically target one profession, in this case, innkeepers. It was illegal for anyone to steal, but additional punishments were available for a group that was believed to be especially corrupt. Despite the force of such legal restrictions, it seems to have been commonplace for merchants to dodge or otherwise mitigate the formal institutional powers that wish to control them. Nico Flora has lately written about fulleries in Pompeii, where internally to a workshop where non-elites mingled with their peers, legal status seems to have been a secondary determinant of social power at best. In these contexts as elsewhere, the law was only as powerful as its enforcers, and many were as distrustful of magistrates as they were of merchants. As presented satirically, in Petronius's Satyricon. Instead, most relied on social norms to structure their own behavior and to enforce acceptable conduct among others. These just out on the interpersonal level. And merchant stereotypes of a similar kind to those that were commonplace among elites could be activated in contexts where they would be usefully applied to shame, to shame and discredit personal enemies. We see this happen in specific conflicts or on top of recourse to legal institutions, stereotypes are raised frequently to strengthen the case of the plaintiff. Thus, in Roman Egypt, a man named Ptolemaios, complaining to the Epistrategos about an assault perpetrated against him, takes the time to paint his assailant not only as a naturally violent and nasty man, but also as a greedy mon moneylender who charged his helpless clients extortionate rates of interest. The magistrate, it's to be supposed, could use this information to extrapolate the kind of person he was dealing with and to act according to his own set of biases. Ptolemaeus believes, probably rightly, that his stereotypes about moneylenders will closely resemble those of the magistrate. In general, our evidence makes it clear that even if greedy, violent men could be brought up on charges for assault, most were still to run a business and turn a profit. Still, this doesn't mean that merchants ever achieved a position much greater than frustrated tolerance, or that they were able to operate without additional oversight. It was clear that retailers and artisans were not to be trusted, nor were they to be extended the benefit of the doubt. Whatever good they did was in spite of their nature, while every misstep, intentional or otherwise, was because of their inherently bad character. Stereotypes helpfully are self-reinforcing, with confirmation bias regularly leading the way in preventing most people in the heat of the moment to see that their opinions are in any way faulty or exaggerated. Merchants were very aware of these prejudices and their potential consequences. Even at the end of their lives, when they took pains to record their successes for posterity, they still expressed their anxiety that stereotypical beliefs would functionally erase their individual accomplishments. They especially seek to head off accusations of greed or deceit, either with denials or statements of their own virtues. Funerary inscriptions are full of such efforts, including numerous superlatives and the formulae of sine without combined with some vice. Both are to be found in the inscription of Lucius Statius Anesimus, a man described as being fedelissimus, the natural antonym of perfidious, deceitful, and living sine macula without shame or disgrace. Other merchants choose to disown fraude, trickery, and crimine, wrongdoing, in much the same way. And it's a trend that is known from a variety of places throughout the empire, especially in the second and third century. The anxiety evidently was widespread enough that even elite authors held some awareness that merchants did not appreciate being characterized in this way. Going back to philosopher Phoenician, there we see an attempt to push back against the sanctimonious posturing of the vine dresser, trying to see that their work was not so very different after all, and that both required a market for their goods. The 
the Phoenician is ultimately unsuccessful, as Philostratus does not truly intend to portray all, but it's an effort that implicitly acknowledges that there was some unfairness in the blanket condemnation of tradesmen and in the blanket praise of farmers. Most sensitive of Roman authors are not necessarily more empathetic or kind to merchants, but they are at least able to acknowledge that not all merchants are identical. Jordan has already mentioned Cicero's famous passage in the De Officiis, and it offers the most constructive example of this, as he recognizes at least six categories of commercial occupation, each with a set of defining characteristics. His categories are naturally somewhat flawed, including several substantial points of overlap. But what remains fairly stable across his categories are the stereotypes that were associated with specific kinds of work. Already in our workshop, I've made an effort to create a typology of Cicero's prejudice, looking especially at the model of stereotype formation developed by Fisk et al., which uses competition and warmth as axes along which groups may be plotted. But it's possible to summarize Cicero's views relatively simply. Moneylenders are greedy. Retailers and wholesalers are deceitful because of their own greed. Manual laborers are dirty. And even those who were freeborn are essentially enslaved by their poverty and dependence on others. Artisans are vulgar because they labor in dirty workshops. Professionals are somewhat better, mostly because they train in cleaner environments. But those who cater to sensual pleasure not only combine all of the worst faults of the other categories, but are even more to be despised because they make the vices of others worse through temptation. Others have studied Cicero's categorization with more nuance than I will be able to muster at present. But critically, non-elite sources echo many of these same generalizations, and they are often even more specific in their critiques of individual professions. The Honora Critica, itself a product of one of Cicero's professional types, records that courtesans and charlatans, itself a grouping that rather shows its hand, are represented in dreams by marine birds who grab and gobble down whatever they can because such people are rapacious and foolish. In the same way, vultures can be read as a good sign for potters and tanners because they too are rightfully shunned by polite society when they concern themselves with dirty and dead things. Similar interpretations, Artemidorus' view of trade is not universally bad but it is profoundly casual in its attribution of baseness and habitual vice to people in many professions. Rarely, Pompeian graffiti accuses inn and barkeeps of the city of being deceitful and of having miserly habits. I'm being told my internet connection is unstable, so if you lose me, please shout. One especially clear example in the graffiti directly accuses a coppa or a tavern keeper of serving his customers watered down wine while enjoying the good stuff himself. The scribbler accuses the man of lying and wishes that he would experience the disappointment and frustration he inflicts upon his customers. The practice of watering down wine was typical in the Roman world, but evidently this vendor crossed some kind of line, attempting to save himself money and cheating his customers in the process. These examples in the graffiti generally target a specific merchant rather than expressing generalities about the group as a whole, but they consist or that customers primed by stereotypes were more likely to think the worst of retailers. In terms of innkeepers, Horace's satires preserve a nearly identical accusation that his innkeeper served only the meagerest portions over a dirty smoking cook fire. Even if Horace's work wasn't being carefully read by the Pompeii man in the street, the overlaps are telling of a widespread cultural distaste and distrust. Furthermore, graffiti like this, near or even on a business, could encourage for future patrons to find fault with the business, even if none necessarily existed. Even without graffiti and live uh, reporting on ancient uh, uh, interest uh, you know, review sites, 
some professions were clearly the target of more specific kinds of stereotyping. But these belong to even more nuanced categories than those drafted by Cicero or explored in the Unora Critica. Non-elite Romans separated out certain trades and isolated them for unique kinds of scrutiny and ridicule. The best documented of these is the case of barbers, who are known from a wide range of sources to be gossips and therefore indiscreet and untrustworthy with sensitive information. Jerry Toner and Sean Lewis have both studied barbers closely and noted that their interactions with their clients were almost certainly reciprocal exchanges of information, with barber shops creating, as they do in the present day, natural hubs through which news was received, analyzed, and spread. They were useful to everyone involved, but bias against gossip, which was believed to be at best an idle practice and at worst malicious, made it popular to mock and avoid barbers, at least on a superficial level. Philogelos provides a clear example of this action. Quote, when a talkative barber asked, how should I cut your hair? A witty man replied, silently. The joke is one of many about barbers. And indeed, humor seems to have been one of the few positive things associated with the trade, as a now lost collection of jokes once existed titled At the Barber Shop. The Philogelos is likely a fourth century CE text, but this particular joke is probably much older, as a version exists in Plutarch that makes the customer the king Archelaus, likely the fifth century BCE king of Macedon. There, as in the joke book, the implication is that the customer is wise not to engage with the barber, not only to avoid idle chatter, but also to protect himself from the barber's tendency to know and then say too much. Whether king or wit, the joke mocks the barber as an annoyance and as a chatterbox, fairly innocuous failings that perhaps mask the deeper fear that barbers inspired. Since these workers enjoyed not only the intimacy of one-on-one -on -one time with their clients, who might be tempted to respond to his chatter with personal confidences, but also held a recognizable weapon in their hand while they plied their trade. Even great men were vulnerable to their barber's blade, and anecdotally, we learn that at least some customers were uncomfortable trusting their person to this population. At least two cases show barbers being physically punished for running their mouths, one of which is connected to a joking threat of violence against a king. Clearly, this was a population that knowingly or not had the ability to inspire fear in powerful men. At its most essential level, this is why Cicero would have lumped barbers in with food vendors and perfumers in his category of purveyors of sensual pleasure. Whether physically or morally, these were fields that posed a threat to elite customers, and they should be kept at a distance for the safety and betterment of everyone involved. Of course, as Mayer and others have rightly noted, trade continued. Barbers were necessary as were food vendors, and even the most unscrupulous scrupulous, greedy merchant could make a living, provided he lacked more honest competition. My point, however, is that even as their businesses survived, merchants were regularly made aware of their own marginality through affronts as pernicious as the microaggression wielding mosquitoes. As in those cases, some merchants chose to brazen out the stigma. A character like Scours from Pompeii comes to mind, who decorated his home with images of the garum he produced, even as he promoted his son or perhaps grandson into public office and away from trade, or Urasakis with his bakery tomb. But others were cowed and even apologetic in the face of these attacks. The funerary inscription of the slave boy Vitalis concludes with an apology for cheating customers with the justification that he only cut corners to enrich his master cum father. At either extreme, we see merchants who are reacting to the bias of others and who lacked sympathetic bystanders willing to come to their aid. Importantly, these were merchant specific impulses. We do not see non-merchants adopting these postures of either reclamation or apology. Farmers, even poor ones, did not face these same sources of opposition. Though joke books target Sidonians, eggheads, and occasionally rubes, there are no comparable non-elite sources that single out a group as broad or as commonplace as retailers or artisans, and the attacks made against them seem to unequivocally have hit their mark. 
even if the Vitaluses of the Roman world managed to get by to run a business, they were aware in life and in death that their actions, in some cases their whole lives, warranted some kind of apology. What we are seeing is a world where stereotypes left both direct and subtle marks on the population. Importantly, not all of these prejudices arise from elite disdain, but they cannot be fully divorced from that either. Romans held a remarkably uniform negative opinion of commerce, one that was as potent among non-elites in social settings as it was among elites and in the law. In the face of such opposition, merchants strategized as means to set themselves apart from the pack and to advertise their personal virtues in the face of universalizing claims about their vices. The theory of negativity bias, which states that humans are inclined to believe and give weight to negative information, even in the face of more numerous or relevant positive data, plays an important role in understanding how and why Roman merchants had reason to feel so beset by negative stereotypes. Even in cases where evidence of good merchant conduct was plentiful, anomalous incidents of negative actions, words, or events were more likely to set back their social standing and therefore their social mobility drastically. Even if today the loudest voices decrying merchants from antiquity come from elite authors with esoteric interests, we cannot discount the impact that this societal outlook had on merchants, who not only worked in a field that would never be the Roman ideal spouted by those who enjoyed their otium, but also faced a consistent stream of jokes, offhand remarks, and snide comments. Merchants experienced these regularly and ultimately cannot be characterized as either particularly blissful or unaware of the dislike of those around them. Thank you.